Hello. Uh, my name is Allison Wilmore. I am a critic and culture writer at BuzzFeed News, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Fox. Uh, now, I, I'm sure that I feel like this movie, maybe more than any I've, I've seen in recent years, ha wants, makes you want to ask questions and, and talk through. So I just have a few questions before we'll turn this over to the audience. Maybe we could start off by, uh, you can tell us a bit about how this film came about. Uh, you are, you've had a background in documentaries, made multiple features and a miniseries. Um, did you think about in making I guess you could call this your fiction debut, but it's very autobiographical. Did you ever think about this as a nonfiction film first or scripted? How did it start? Yeah, um, as you know from the film, I wrote uh, the tale when I was 13 and fictionalized it. And um, quite frankly, every time I thought of turning this story into a film, I always thought it would be fiction. Um, it took me years and years and years to mature enough to get to a point where I was ready to tell it. Um, for many, many years, as you know from the story, it was what I called my first relationship. And it was only when I was shooting a series called Flying Confessions of a Free Woman uh, in the Millennium, which is a six-part series, and I was talking to women all over the world that suddenly... I started to hear the same story as mine over and over again. Uh, and it didn't matter what culture, it didn't matter class, it was always like, not that woman. But also, um, it seemed like all the stories had an architecture. And suddenly, my own little private memory couldn't remain there. And I used the word sexual abuse for the first time. Um, I was 45 years old, um, and at that moment, I think I really began to think, okay, now it's time to make this as a fiction film. And meanwhile, my mother also entered the game, as you saw um, in the film, she's played by Ellen Burstyn, fantastically. And um, my mother, very near that time, actually was cleaning the house and found this story uh, that I wrote at 13 and called me hysterically on the phone. And it, it wasn't as if I'd forgotten anything that happened, but she really, really pushed me to find the real people now, and um, we talked a lot about it at that moment. And in lieu of being able to kill them, frankly, she said, well, at least you can make a film about it. So it was sort of a... a confluence of events that brought me ready to begin to write the tale. Um, originally, I wrote it completely in the backstory. That was year one, and put it aside. I was making other films. And then um, when I came back to it, I realized I wasn't really just interested in the sexual abuse story. What I was really interested in was memory and how that 13-year-old had spun this story that really created the woman I would become. And so I began to investigate it on two levels, the past and the present. And with my mother's bidding, as you see with Ellen Burstyn, with Laura saying, you know, you, you have to go find them, you have to find them now. I actually also found the children that were around me and the coaches. And the script is based on a lot of real research. So that's a very long answer. <laughs> Very long. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that idea of how you can put the subjectivity and the kind of slipperiness of memory on screen, because I think the film does it very, in a very beautiful and very cinematic way. Can you tell me a bit about how you came up with how to put this in visuals? Mm -hmm. um, how did I come up with it? I think once that I realized it was about memory and the creation of self, I knew that I had never seen a film like what, what was in my mind. And um, I know narrative structure very well. I've been working in the field like 35 years before I began this. And um, it's simply that there, I sort of had to throw out the book and just start waiting in the, in in the chaos of what is this about and how do I portray this and what are those links between the past and present 
And um, I began to write like units of, oh, this happened and then I remembered that. And just like these little units of past and present, and I came up with hundreds of them probably, at the same time, I was finding the real people. I was talking to my mother, my partner, um, and I was transcribing everybody I spoke to. And so that became another text. And then um, I found out that I actually didn't really know who I was at 13 anymore. Like this concept that we are one person and that we're the same person from beginning to end, from the time you're born, as you grow, all of a sudden broke and I realized, no, I'm many people. And the person I am now has no connection to that 13 year old. In fact, I have no idea why she did what she did. And so that became the crux of these fantasy interviews. And to try to investigate, well, what did you say? Now remember, I had a lot of, um, I've been a writer since I was a kid, I had a lot of diaries, I had the tale. So there was a lot of evidence, but there were gaps that I, need, I had to fill in. So that was another thing I did. And also, even though I, re I met Mrs. G, the real Mrs. G, several times that Elizabeth Debicki plays, and those scenes are based on real events. Um, there was a point when I realized she would never tell me what I wanted to know, which was why and how. And so, again, I returned to fantasy to make it up. And, and the same thing with the real Bill. Like, I would never get him to say, well, well, why me? You know, I don't think he would ever speak to that. So, again, I made it up. So, these are some of the tropes that were created in the writing of the film. All right, one more question before we turn things over. Um, you mentioned Laura, and she gives this really kind of extraordinary performance. Um, can you tell us a bit about how she came on board and sure. about like uh, directing someone who is playing a variation on yourself? Sure. Um, Laura Dern came on board really early. Once the script was solid, um, I had the good fortune. Orrin Moverman is an old friend. And he came on board as a producer. He was really in love with the project. And another old friend is Brian De Palma. And Brian was around when I was writing the script. And um, one day we were having coffee. And he said, well, who are you going to cast for you? And it's got to be the right person. And so we had this short list that we had developed. And Brian you know, sort of grabbed it from me and said, Laura Dern, you know, she's the only one who has the guts to play this character. And she's perfect to play you. So frankly, I really didn't cast her. So Brian, you know, literally picked up his cell phone, called his agent, got her number, left her a message, and then later called her and pitched both me as a filmmaker and the script to her. And then um, she read and sent her the script, and she read it and really um, loved it. And then Oren Moverman called her as well, and he, she's a big fan of his and. He pitched the script and me to her, and then we met, and um, she said yes, and that was a year and a half before we had any financing. So it was quite extraordinary, and, and with Oren's help, we continued to cast, although the financing was very far away. Um, we, the first financing was a German co-production, and American funding was very slow to come in. Our real major equity partner is Game Changer Films, whose mandate is to fund women. And I think, if you remember, this is long before Me Too and Time's Up. I think if it wasn't for Game Changer, we probably wouldn't have gotten the equity involved. Uh, and then it's uniquely funded by about a third by, about f by philanthropic funds because the equity just could never make the amount of money we needed to make the film. Great. Um, all right, do we have questions in the audience? Um, I don't know if we have microphones or not, so maybe, oh, we do, we have one. Okay, sir. Two questions. Um, where did you grow up, i.e., where was the film set and where was the film filmed? The film is set, actually, in North Carolina. Uh, it was filmed uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana, and L.A. twice. It, we had three shoots over the course of eight months. Um, I'm from f outside of Philadelphia. 
And so all everything was changed in for legal reasons and all the names of the characters and the locations and even Bill's sport is changed for legal reasons. Hi. So obviously this happened when you were a child and you had a certain narrative when you were a child and then had a different one when you were an adult. But I can't help but wonder if how it's affected your childhood based on what you now know, if that makes sense. How did it affect my childhood? So how would it have affected sure, your childhood? Sure, I mean, we all have a fantasy that that 13-year-old when she met Bill and Mrs. G was innocent. But in fact, you know, like every child, I had faced issues in my family. I felt invisible. I had, um, you know, was highly sensitive and was struggling with things in the world. So it became another event in a complex childhood. That's how I saw it. Of course, as an adult looking back, I see that it was the end of a certain kind of trust in the world. And it didn't change me, it didn't stop me from going out in the world, but it made me feel very strongly that um, I had to take my life in my hands first, as you hear in the film, from my parents, and then back again from these adults that betrayed a physical trust. Um, I think the film is, for me, a lot about that moment in a girl's life where she still has a, a loud voice and a lot of agency, not loud externally, but I felt like I knew what I was doing. And I was making, quote, decisions. The only problem was I had no experience. And so when I met the real Bill in real life, well, the biggest shock was, you know, one of the things that I would never have been able to judge is that he was a complete womanizer. And as a child, how would you even know that? You have no experience, but as an adult, well, that takes about three seconds, you know? Th that's a, it's not a, a, a way to answer. The bottom line is that this event is part of who I am. And um, I think I gained and I lost. Of course, you see uh, the child really talked about the gains, you know? Um, and as an adult, of course, I grapple with both the gains and the losses, so maybe that's the best way to answer. Yeah, there was this one. <coughs> it was a wonderful film, very affecting. Put it closer to your mouth. Okay. There yeah. you go. Okay. So my question is, what kind of impact have you seen from the film on Bill and others, you know, in his life as well as other um, survivors? Well, the real Bill, I would have no idea about because he doesn't know there's a film. So, I mean, I'm sure he may find out. He's a, quite an old man now. Um, and he was still keeping tabs on me when I met him. So, But there was no effort to tell him that I was making a film because I didn't want him to stop that, and we were going to cover quite well. So it's between him and God, really, how he feels about the film, and if he even ever acknowledges to anybody but himself that it's about him. Um, in terms of the goals of the film are very wide. First, they're to reach as many million people as possible. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to make fiction was to transcend the limit of documentaries and to really create a story that anybody could watch and go on a journey and understand themselves and the world differently. Um, the goal for um, survivors and this particular issue is really to change the conversation and to say, you know, classically in the world, this um, this forbidden topic of child sexual abuse is presented in very black and white terms. You will know who the perpetrator is. He looks evil. Um, he, you know, he's dark. And frankly, most perpetrators 
are in our midst. They're lauded by the community. They're successful. Statistically, 93% of the children know the perpetrators. Um, they're not strangers. They're not lurking in dark shadows. So that's one thing. But also that sexual, child sexual abuse is extremely complex for the child, for the family, for the community. And this film hopes to open up that narrative so that we can really understand it better to prevent it, but also so that we can allow people to speak honestly about their complex feelings of love sometimes, tenderness, feeling special. Um, and on a bigger level, I hope that it makes all of you ask yourself about your memories and how you constructed yourself and um, really how we tell ourselves stories to survive, which can be about anything from someone dying in your life to divorce to family trauma to war. I mean, these are, this is about a very large issue about memory. Those are my hopes, anyway. Sure. Get the mic quickly. Go, go, go. Thank you. I'll, I'll make it brief then. My question pertains to your mom, mm -hmm. and I found it very touching that Ms. Burstyn said to you in the film that she felt as if she failed. Mm -hmm. Did you, as a parent, I can really, yeah. that, that hit me. Yeah. And I wondered if your mom actually said that and how she's coped with her perceived failure, which in some sense wasn't truly a failure. Right. I think that's a great question because another fantasy is that if you're a good parent, bad things don't happen to your children. And it's just so ridiculous. Like, in, in the world, you know, we can do our best, but you cannot protect your children from everything. And in this case, in my case, every child's sexual abuse is different. I was running away from my parents to grow up. And my parents weren't perfect parents. It was a large, chaotic household. They had, my dad had a big career. They had a big social life. But they were full-time parents. And they really tried. And I could list a million good things that they did, did for me and gave me over years. What this film is about, I really think, is a mother who says it's more important for my daughter to face the truth than for me to look good, even to myself in the world. And I really appreciate what my mother did, which is ultimately she showed herself as failing. And she wanted me to make this film, she pushed me to make this film, even though it would show that she somehow did miss out an obvious beat in my life. Now, did I want her to stop me? No. Did I want somebody to stop me? Yes. I mean, I, th I can tell you honestly, in my mind, I was hoping the real Mrs. G would stop this. But my parents, I was lying through my teeth to. Um, and you see also, it's 1973, and my parents had a very traditional marriage which grew and changed. My mother actually went back to work. She became a different person. The dynamics in the family changed. But at that moment, she really deferred to my father. And my father really knew nothing about girls and women and danger. He thought the world was safe, you know? So there's a lot you can say about that. But my mother did absolutely apologize many times to me. and. I think the real act of mothering was her going on this journey with me to make the film. She, we taped many of our conversations. Those conversations in the film are based on real conversations. She you know, was there when I was finding real people. I was really calling her, and those conversations Laura's having with Ellen are based on that. She really did say, are you going to wear a wire, for example? Um, and, you know, for her, this was instead of getting them, she was going to get me to make this film. This was, in, this was her way to make me face the truth of how I was hurt.
Does that answer your question? It does. Can I follow up with a comment? Sure. Jews do ride yeah, well, in 1973, I was the only one I knew. And my family knew nothing about horses, frankly. I mean, it was way beyond our even, this was a real, you know, they were, you know, new money. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm just a filmmaker. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think my effort is to see Bill three-dimensionally as a person. And I think, again, that we f when we flatten the vision of the perpetrator, we miss an opportunity to understand. And without understanding, we can't prevent. So that's my point of view. Is it true? I don't know. Yeah. I think this man. Well, sir, as I said to my wife, I said, it's lucky what Bill did didn't do it to my sister or, or my daughter. I don't have either, but it wouldn't be good for Bill. Uh, but what is very disturbing is how do we explain Mrs. B, uh, Mrs. G's role in all of this, and even Iris? who was young but was, you know, 19 years of age, a college student, presumably knows the difference between right and wrong. I mean, and while older men have been attracted to younger women since the beginning of time, there's a difference between a 19-year-old and a 13-year-old, a big difference, uh, literally a gulf. Yeah. Um, if, if it was Iris, Mrs. G., and Bill having something, well, you know, it was the 70s. <laughs> but the, the, the two women's role in bringing you into it, to me, is, adds a deeply disturbing dimension to this. Yeah, I, I think that um, I totally agree. I think the other thing we have to talk about when we talk about child sexual abuse is often not directly, but how women collude to help cover the man who is doing it. This happens a lot. But what happened in this film is, is so commonplace. I think statistically, one in eight minutes, one child in eight minutes is being sexually abused. And let's remember, it's not just girls. And one of the really interesting things for me showing this film is the number of men who've come up, come up to me privately afterwards and said, that is my story. So if women underreport, men really underreport. Um, so I can only say yes, yes, yes. Um, I think we just have to really try to understand so we can be more aware, so we can talk to our children. I mean, again, one of the things you see in this film is my parents were still of that 50s mentality that children were to be seen and not heard. and. There was a very vertical conversation being had in my family, particularly with my mom and I. Um, and I think we have an opportunity today to have a horizontal conversation with our kids and to really be aware of you know, what they're doing when they're away from us and to hope they will speak. One of the things I think we have to be really careful of is though to overprotect because children do need a certain amount of freedom and they do need to make mistakes, not a hopefully this big of a mistake, but they need to make mistakes. So it's a constant um, balance. Un unfortunately, very, very difficult. Take one more question from the back. Is there someone from the back? Um, two in the back. Yeah, over there. It's only one question. Okay. Uh, you were so in denial at the beginning of the film. Uh, and I, I found that a little hard to understand. Mm -hmm. and, and then I was wondering what, how you arrived at that aha moment, because it didn't, seem, uh, it didn't seem totally clear. It just seemed to sort of creep up on you. Mm -hmm. But the amount of denial in the beginning was uh, uh, staggering, considering what happened to you. Yeah. I. Um it's interesting, I totally agree. When we were making the film, I kept saying this film is about denial. Um, so I agree with you. 
Totally. Um, but I would ask yourself, are you not in denial as well? Are we all not in denial of things that we simply don't see? And maybe your husband sees it, or maybe your mother or your child sees something. But in any case, not to defend my denial, because it's quite big. Um, it's, I never forgot what happened to me. It's just that I didn't see it as abuse. I saw what I got from it, and um, I called it a relationship. And the change was quite slow. Sorry. And I got an A, what can I say? And, and I got a lot of attention. And for someone who was, un, you know, felt unattractive as a little, as a young person, invisible, the boys were not noticing me. Um, my friends, you know, I was quite quiet. I got a lot of attention and that attention helped me to think I was somebody because these important adults, and this is common by the way, and it's common that people don't admit abuse until they're in middle age. So whatever my denial is, it's also quite common. But so I took the things, I was quite pragmatic as a kid. I took what I got and I used it to the nth degree and I went on and I was not gonna be destroyed by this event. And that rolled into me being a filmmaker, me traveling the world extensively in regions where were dangerous and you know people didn't go i was not going to let this stop me i was a hero i married to the man that 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 person martin is based on uh we've been together 16 years yeah you've been doing outreach attached to this film yes i think we have uh, your producer simone to talk about it yes exactly so in relating to all your questions we really want to use this film to open the conversation about memory and abuse. And it will go on HBO May 26 around the world. And we have a lot planned for it. But here is Simone Perot, my producer, to tell you about it. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, these conversations are really important to us as we go around the world um, with the film. And um, as Jennifer is describing, the power of this film is really to open up a dialogue and help change and deepen the conversation around child sexual abuse. So early on, when we were making the film, we always knew we were going to have an educational outreach campaign, um, really about connecting with audiences, connecting with nonprofits, and the experts in the field that are doing this work every day. And we're creating a website, we've created uh, screening guides, the night of the broadcast um, and beyond, we're looking at creating discussion circles uh, around the world. So all of this is really happening grassroots style and we are um, raising funds through our nonprofit. So um, just wanted to, if anyone was moved, we have cards outside. Um, but there is really a point in time that we have right now given our culture and we're seeing that audiences are much more open to talk about these topics. And um, a film like this can really help generate much larger conversations. So uh, if anyone is interested, we're also, um, last piece of it is we're looking to create um, sections of the film for age appropriate audiences. So we wanna build a, um, a curriculum uh, around how parents can talk with their children, how to um, foster healthy relationship and dialogue. So that's another core piece of our educational outreach campaign. And uh, it's quite extraordinary to work on a feature film where we can employ these documentary and grassroots models together. And I think we have something uh, pretty special here. So thank you for listening. Great, thank you. Oh.